Well, it's truly a blessing to be here with such a great church family. It's great to have family here in town, some from a long ways away. So it's just an extra special Sabbath for us. So thanks for being a part of this day. Um, Let's, as a church together, as far as possible, if you're able, um, let's bow before our God and lift up uh, the concerns and the things on our heart to him at this time. Loving Heavenly Father, we believe that you are a loving God. We've sung it this morning. All our lives you've been faithful. And although we haven't always understood the things we've gone through, we believe, Jesus, we believe, God, that you love us and that you have our best good at heart. Father, our world is suffering and struggling. Many of us are going through our own trials. Think of Laura, who had surgery just yesterday. We pray for her recovery. We pray for strength for her. Lord, uh, in our own circles, we pray that you'll use us to help be your arms of love, to be agents relieving the suffering of others in our area of this big world you've made. And thank you, Lord, for the joy of life and the joy that, that this life isn't the only life we have, but we have an everlasting life with you. And we can't wait for that day. So give us strength, Father. Use us to be a blessing. And we thank you for your amazing love. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, who remembers what we have been talking about? We're doing a series right now, a four-part series. Who can recall what the topic of the series is? You could just call it out if you're remembering. Why is there so much pain and suffering in our world? If God is so good, why is the world so bad? You know, if you missed the first couple weeks, I have good news for you. You're able to watch them all online. They're recorded, they're on YouTube, and yep, Jaden, I thank you for all your help, and Rohan, and Henry, and, and of course the adults too. Uh, but if you're interested in getting back in the booth and helping out those adults, uh, they are happy to train you in to do all of the things that they do. So I'm going to do a brief review before we get into the message for today. We have seen... Uh, in our series thus far, a variety of things. Um, One, we've seen God is love. God is love, and God gave creatures the ability to love. Uh, But when you give freedom and love, um, there is the possibility of evil. Evil can result. Uh, It's not necessary, not required, but evil is an option. And sadly, we saw that humans and divine beings, angels, have used and misused their freedom to do evil. Uh, This means that God often has good desires that are unfulfilled, we saw. Even though he wishes the world were different, because of his ultimate desire for love to flourish forever, and not just temporarily, but forever, he has to allow freedom to continue. We saw that evil... And rebellion is Satan's fault. It's not God's fault. But God, thankfully, has a good plan to end it all someday. The sin, suffering, death, sorrow, he's got a plan. But we saw in the parable of the sower, um, or a certain parable of the sower, that to eliminate evil too soon would result in irreversible collateral damage. And so we have to wait till the harvest 
when all things are ripe and ready for evil finally to be eliminated. We've also seen in our series that that the free will defense for the problem of suffering provides a logical explanation. And even I showed quotes from various famous atheist thinkers who said, yeah, this solves or at least provides a plausible explanation for the logical problem of evil. It allows for God to still be God, all-loving, all-knowing, all-powerful, and still for evil to exist. But today, I want to take it a little further. Uh, I want to stretch your brains a little bit, so I need you to put on your thinking caps because it's going to stretch a little bit more. We could have ended this series after the first presentation or the second presentation, but we have two more because this is a big problem. And I think there are even more answers that help provide a framework for us to think about. But as we start the topic for today, I'm reminded of the words in 1 Corinthians 13, 12, where Paul says, we only know in part. We only see through a glass dimly. In other words, we're looking at it a little blurry here. We can't see the whole picture. So even as I'm going to share some more things that I think are important and powerful, there's a whole lot more. The answer to the problem that Job had in his suffering, God doesn't give him an explanation. He just says, do you know what I know? In an oversimplistic manner. So there's a lot more that's going on here, but I think we're going to find some, some, some powerful lines of thought that can help further our thinking on this problem and on this topic. So there's two major areas that we're going to focus on this morning. Number one, we're going to look at the nature of the battle between good and evil. We've identified previously there's a battle going on, but what's it like? And number two, we're going to look at what maybe are there rules of engagement or parameters in which this conflict takes place. To quote from uh, my one of my favorite professors and this book, if you really want to dive deep into the topic, you should just buy the book because it'll go way deeper than what I'm going in, in this four-part series. But the author, John Peckham, he said this, at the level of sheer power, when it comes to the nature of the conflict between God and Satan, at the level of sheer power, no one could oppose an omnipotent being. Any conflict between an omnipotent God and other could, only, could not be one of sheer power, but must be of a different kind. It'd be like me trying to wrestle a sumo wrestler, right? It's just, it's not even a fair fight. So he says, what then is the nature of the conflict? Scripture depicts the conflict as a dispute over what? God's moral character and government. It's not so much a physical battle, it's a battle of ideas. He continues by saying that there have been cosmic allegations have been raised uh, before the heavenly council, claiming that God is not wholly good, loving, or just. This then is largely an epistemic conflict. Epistemic means it's relating to knowledge or knowing. Uh, This conflict, it cannot be won by mere exercise of power, but it's met by an extended demonstration of what? Of character in the cosmic courtroom drama. So in other words, Satan has been slandering God ever since the beginning when he began to rebel. Started in heaven, it came down to this earth. And God could have just eliminated Lucifer right at the very beginning, but it would have actually made the problem worse. It would have created more questions, more doubt, more fear, a lack of trust. And those things aren't what promote the flourishing of love in the universe forever. And so for God to overcome and win, it would take not a battle of force, but a demonstration of character. Now, we can get hints of the the nature of this battle in Scripture, and even in the very first chapters of the Bible, in the book of Genesis, we get a a clue of how the devil is operating this battle in this world, a battle over the minds. Genesis 2 um, depicts this battle in very different terms from what we typically think. Remember, God had told Adam and Eve, eat from every tree of the garden except for one, 
and then Eve found herself at that tree having a conversation with this oddly talking serpent. And notice what he said. He said, has God actually said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Kind of questioning, kind of doubting a little bit. Eve says, well, you know, we're not supposed to eat from it. If we do, we'll die, or even if we touch it. And notice his response. He says, you're not going to die. God knows in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you'll be like him, knowing both good and evil. Do you see what's happening here? He's insinuating God has something that you should want. He's withholding it from you because he wants to keep you down. God's lying. I'm telling you the truth. You should experience this so that you can have what God has. And boy, doesn't he tell us that lie in so many other ways and versions? If you want to have fun in life, you can't be a Christian. Let me tell you what, I have a lot of fun in life. Sometimes too much fun. And I've, I've heard you laughing at church. Sometimes you guys have a lot of fun. We have a lot of fun. Satan is telling this lie. God's holding something back. God is not all good. God is not all loving. He doesn't have your best interest at heart. And notice the words of Victor Hamilton in his commentary on Genesis. He said, here's a mixture of misquotation, denial, and slander fed to the woman by the snake. Or as, as John Peckham says, from Eve's perspective, this, the serpent's assertion confronts her with an epistemic choice, a choice based on her knowledge. Believe God or entertain the serpent's insidious slander of God's character. Either the serpent is a liar or God is. And at the outset of the canon, the canon of scripture, there's this epistemic conflict over the character of God and its front and center. And we're hit with it right in the first couple chapters of the Bible. We're given this choice. Who's telling the truth? Now I want you to understand, God isn't trying to win this battle so that he can just make himself look good. Like if you were slandered, you might want to say, that's not true, and defend yourself just because you don't want to look bad. That's not what God is doing. Literally, the fate of the universe depends on whether or not God wins the war. God is above everything. He doesn't need people to believe something uh, just for his own sake or selfish purposes. God is doing this because he wants love and freedom and happiness and joy to be the universal experience of all creatures for eternity. And that can't happen until this conflict is settled. Now we can go in the beginning of the Bible and see this. We can go to the end of the Bible. In Revelation chapter 13, Satan uh, as a dragon depicted there, is working behind something called the sea beast. And notice what the, the beast from the sea is doing. It opened its mouth to utter what? Blasphemies, to slander God. Blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. So it's all throughout scripture. It's in the beginning, it's in the end. As John Peckham says, from Genesis to Revelation, questions regarding God's character and government are raised in heaven and on earth. Since the enemy's slanderous allegations are epistemic in nature, relating to our knowledge, they cannot effectively be answered by a display of power, however great. Indeed, no amount of power exercised by a king would prove to his subjects that he is not unjust. No show of executive power could clear the name of a president accused of corruption. A conflict over character cannot be settled by sheer power, but requires what? Demonstration. God can't just say, you're wrong, and you're dead. That would make it worse. There must be a demonstration of God's goodness and also of Satan's badness in order for this conflict to ultimately be settled. So we come back to these two points that we're looking at today. Uh, what's the nature of the battle? We've seen it's not so much physical. Uh, and that's why when you read the Bible, you don't read about angels with bazookas or demons launching grenades, and sadly, not even a word about lightsabers. A 
Apparently, it's not a thing, uh, at least not in heaven, and the angels aren't using them. This is a much different battle. It's a different battle. So the second issue then is, are there rules or parameters in which this battle takes place? How does it work? And I would say, yes, there are rules. And I'm going to tell you already, we don't have the book of galactic warfare between God and Satan. We don't have those rules. I can't print you off a copy or email you a PDF. But the, the Bible gives us hints that they exist. And, and we're going to take a look at some of that this morning. You know, even in the book of Job, which we mentioned earlier, there are hints that there's something more going on. In the first two chapters, there's a heavenly council. Satan shows up to it, makes slanderous accusations against God, and they agree upon some parameters in which Satan can demonstrate his claims, and it's tragic. And, and we're not going to take time to go through that whole story today and, and talk about all the ramifications, but we can see there's actually two uh, heavenly councils that take place. There's some rules of engagement that Satan is allowed to operate under, uh, and then he comes back later on before the same heavenly council, and they agree upon different rules. And Satan goes to test his claims based upon those rules. So it's not just that there are uh, parameters in which the conflict takes place that are static, that are, that are set once and are universally uh, applicable. Apparently, these rules can change that are agreed upon by both parties in front of a heavenly council, not done in secret, but done openly, and these rules can change. Now, the Bible actually gives us more hints that these kind of parameters um, exist. But notice here what John Peckham in Theodicy of Love said about it. He said, this evinces, or the story of Job, evinces that not only Satan works within the limits that are known to him and God, but that these rules of engagement can be modified by agreement before the heavenly council. And remember, the point of all of this is because God wants to win the war. And if he doesn't win the war, everybody loses. It's like uh, the old movie Lion King. Maybe some of you saw that years ago. I'm not a big uh, promoter of films, but there's the kingdom of light, and then eventually the kingdom of darkness that takes over. Imagine if Scar and the hyenas had ruled forever and ever. All the animals would have died. It would have been horrible if his rule had lasted forever. And thankfully, the, the creators of the story wrote in redemption and a return to the kingdom of light. But literally, like, our universe faces that possibility if God doesn't win. Spoiler alert, he's already won. And someday, all the battles will be ended. But let's look at the scripture to see other hints that there are some rules of engagement. In the third temptation of Jesus, Satan says something pretty interesting. Luke 4, 6. He said to him, to, to you, Jesus, I will give all this authority and the glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I will. Satan had authority that had been given to him, and Jesus didn't say, no, you don't. There was apparently some sort of understanding that Satan had authority to work in this world. Or what about the way the temptation itself was set up? You remember how it starts? The Bible says Jesus was led away by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. It's like he had an appointment that had been pre-planned. And then after all is said and done, the Bible says that uh, the devil left. He, he finished his temptations, which were the same ones basically that Eve was given in the Garden of Eden. And when it was all said and done, it says he left for a, a, an opportune time later on. This arranged temptation occurred uh, 
apparently there had been some sort of planning about it previously. Or, or we can point to the words that the demons sometimes spoke to Jesus after he cast them out. Things like this, Matthew 8, 29. Behold, they cried out, What have we you to do with us, O Son of God? Have you come to torment us before the what? Before the time. Like, the demons know there is, are time parameters in which they can work. They know there's a judgment, but that there's some time right now. Notice um, the devil, Revelation 12, 12, knows he has short what? Time. Satan knows this himself. Well, what about this one? Jesus' statement to Peter in Luke twenty two thirty one. What's it say there? Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded to have you that he might sift you as wheat. Now, why would Jesus say Satan has demanded to have you if Satan had dominion to do whatever he wanted at any time to anyone? There's apparently he needed permission to go after Peter in some way. As you can imagine, this gets very complex. Um, and re remember, these are mutually agreed upon arrangements before the Heavenly Council. Um, but this is a complicated situation behind the scenes. Or what about the fact that in Nazareth, when Jesus went to his hometown, he wasn't able to do many miracles. He couldn't do a lot of miracles. And we're going to talk about this more in just a moment. But then Jesus also would come to his disciples and they'd say, we couldn't cast out the demon. He says, well, this requires a lot of prayer and fasting. There's some other dynamics that are going on, linked with faith, linked with connection. It's more than just you didn't have faith or God didn't want to heal. We'll talk about this more in just a moment. We saw also in, in Daniel chapter 10, two weeks ago, God sent a message to, da to Daniel, who was praying. When did the message get through? It took three weeks to get there. And then we learn later on, the angel had been stopped by this demonic force holding him back. Now let me ask you something. Is God all-powerful? Is God omnipresent? Is he everywhere in some way? Yeah, scripture indicates this. So if God knows, hey, the UPS has been delayed, does he have the power to just melt away the resistance and send that message? Yeah. But for some reason, he didn't. There must be some sort of covenantal rules of engagement in which God simply didn't exercise his executive authority and overrule to get the message through faster. Something more was going on behind the scenes. So these examples indicate that while Satan has a lot of authority, it is limited. And while God is all-powerful, there are, in some cases, limits to what God is allowing uh, himself to do because of the moral restraints. Now, it isn't clear, even if we were given all of the, the rules of engagement in every scenario, that we'd even be able to comprehend it at this point. Um, it isn't clear. Scripture makes most clear what's most important. And we've already seen what's most important, that God loves us, he has a plan to defeat suffering, and he's coming back to take us back to his kingdom. Amen? Anything else that we might learn or discern is just a little bonus, uh, stretching our minds a little bit. But I want to ask the question. So we see that, that it's not a physical battle primarily. It's more of a battle over the mind and heart. But how does that help us with this problem of suffering? How is this helpful? Well, notice how uh, Dr. Peckham put it in his book. He said, God is doing everything that he morally can to mitigate or eliminate evil within the context of some agreed-upon rules of the cosmic conflict. Knowing, because sometimes we wonder, well, why didn't you stop this thing, God? Why didn't you heal this person, God? There are, are a lot of potential reasons for why that didn't happen. One of which is that there may have been some sort of 
rules of engagement that didn't allow God morally to do what he wished to do. And we already know that that happens sometimes. Does God want to save everybody? Yeah. Is he going to force somebody to go to heaven that doesn't want to go to heaven? No. God has moral restraints upon himself, not, not that it limits his power, but because God is a God of love. And the same thing is true in some of these complex scenarios. We've seen that these rules can be dynamic. They can change. Uh, They're agreed upon by both parties. And it's necessary to have these rules because Satan has been accusing God of being unjust from the very beginning. So if God had just said, all right, you think I'm unjust? Well, here are the rules. Uh, You must follow them all. This is how we're going to settle it. It probably wouldn't have gone over very well. It might have created more doubt. Well, why is God making all the rules? Why can't we agree upon something? It's a very difficult situation. And because God keeps his promise always, and God can't lie, there are times when there are things that God wants to do that he's not morally allowed to do because of these covenants and treaties. Notice how uh, John Peckham continues here. He says, the biblical evidence indicates that there are rules of engagement in the cosmic conflict, and that both parties know the limits in which they might operate toward settling the conflict. Whereas God remains omnipotent, there may be things that God cannot morally do that he might otherwise want to do, like save everybody, even if they don't want to be saved. It would be torture to be in heaven if you didn't want to be there. So I want to go back to that passage of Scripture that we talked about earlier. Uh, That time when God, Jesus, wanted to do more miracles in his hometown. But he couldn't. He could do a few small miracles, but he couldn't do the big ones that he wanted to do. Uh, Now, the Bible says that he marveled at their unbelief. Unbelief can be connected to miracles. Um, It certainly can be the case. But there's also more going on. Let me ask you this. Is God enough, powerful enough to heal people that don't have faith? Of course he could. Uh, do you think the people who didn't have faith would have preferred to be healed rather than not healed? Yeah, absolutely. So why didn't Jesus just heal them anyways? Apparently there were other restrictions upon what God could do in that moment. In some cases, it does appear as God's ability to act may be related to belief. Um, And there may be this connection, and Scripture indicates in multiple places that there is a connection between faith and healing, but it's not always the case. Uh, Not always the case. Notice here, prayer may grant God jurisdiction to act in ways that would not otherwise be available to him within the rules of engagement. So there may be something about us praying that, that allows God more flexibility within these rules to act in the way that he wants to act. But notice this caution. Notice this caution. Since other factors are involved, it might be that in some situations, those other factors are such that no matter how much people pray in good faith, the outcome regarding a specific event might not change. And I share this because sometimes when people aren't healed, we can beat ourselves up saying, oh, I don't have enough faith. Or accuse others, well, they would have been healed if they weren't disbelieving. We need to be very careful against that. There are a lot of factors that we don't see. And I, and I want to be very careful. We're talking about uh, the, a framework for, for why there's suffering in our world. It's unwise to try to apply this to specific cases in your life because we just don't know. Or to, or to go to somebody who's suffering and say, well, there's obviously some rules behind the scenes that doesn't... That's not what a person needs. They need love. They need a reminder, a physical reminder from you that God is love and that you are there to provide that encouragement to them. Here and elsewhere, it appears that there might be rules that prevent God uh, from doing or preventing what he otherwise would choose to do or prevent. If this is correct, 
then there are real limitations and impediments against God's action. These include at least those entailed by one, the consistent granting of free will to creatures, and two, covenantal rules of engagement. Put briefly, our, such limitations and impediments on divine action have significant implications for God's moral ability to reduce or immediately eliminate evil. I think, as you can see, what we're talking about is it's a lot more complex behind the scenes. We've got a God of love that's doing everything he can to help us, to empower us, and to win this battle so that we can all go home to heaven someday soon, to help as many people know his love and see him as a God of love. I like this next one. Put briefly, in any instance where God does not intervene to prevent some horrendous evil, to do so might have been against the rules, impinged on creaturely free will in a way that would undercut the love relationship, or resulted in greater evil or less flourishing of love. There simply is so much going on, we just don't know exactly. But we know that there's some framework. Now, some of you might be thinking, okay, well, I hear what you're saying, but but why would God allow himself to, to make these rules with Satan? Like, why would he engage in this? And again, imagine that you've got a coworker, and the coworker has some grievance against your boss. They go to your boss. Everybody knows about the grievance. They go to the boss, and it, the office of the boss is kind of in a common area where people can see. And the boss starts yelling and saying bad things about the person, and then... Uh, takes them and locks them up in a closet. And then the office gets really quiet. Everyone's pretending like they weren't watching or listening. Would that approach to the situation lend itself towards a healthy work environment? No. That would make things far worse. And you'd be looking for another job. As much as it would have been nice if God could have done that, if that was a viable option, to just say, all right, you're wrong, Lucifer. Here, you're on timeout forever or extinguish you. It would have made things worse. It would have made things worse. In the end, even when we still have questions and all our questions aren't answered, we come back to the cross of Jesus which reminds us that our God is doing everything he can to win and to relieve the suffering in this world so that love and peace and happiness can be the forever reality of our universe and not just a temporary thing. Remember what Jesus said before he went on the cross? Remember what he said there? Going a little further, he fell on his face and prayed, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Did Jesus want to go on the cross? No. Did he hope for another way, a better way? Was there a better way? No. It involved him suffering the ultimate price. Suffered more than any of us will ever suffer. And it was because that was the only way that he could end suffering once and for all. The only way. The great good of ensuring that love flourishes throughout the universe for eternity serves as a morally sufficient reason for God's allowance of evil. Without affirming that any such evil itself is justifiable or necessary for such flourishing. The cross reminds us that God loves us with an everlasting love and he's doing everything he can, always choosing the best for everyone. As we close this morning, I want to remind you about a passage in the book of Isaiah. It's a parable about God and about his people in in the days of Isaiah. It says there in Isaiah 5, I will sing... For the one I love, a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard. God's the loved one here. On a fertile hillside, the vineyard is is his people. 
He dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. And he looked for a, good, a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only what? Bad fruit. He did everything he could to, to get this garden to produce the best grapes possible, but instead it produced bad. Now you dwellers of Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could I have done? What more could have been done in my vineyard that I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield bad? I believe when all is said and done, when all the dust has settled in the universe, and God, uh, I believe God asks us this question, if not, um, if not in, in some definite meeting, but he's open to this question, asking the question, what more could I have done? When we have the chance to review the record, we say, wow, God, you did everything you could. We now understand. You did everything you could, and thank God you won. Friends, the God that hung on the cross for us is a God that we can trust. The God that poured out his life for us is the one that we can get to know personally. He's a God that wants to comfort us and empower us now, and he's a God that someday is going to wipe every tear from our eyes. I want to get to know this God better. How about you? And I look forward to seeing him face to face. He can answer all my questions then. And we'll enjoy his love. And our love forever and forever. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful that you poured out all heaven for us. We don't understand all the things that happen in this world, nor perhaps are we capable of understanding it right now. But we know that we can trust you. We believe we can trust you. Or perhaps we're not sure about that this morning. Lord, continue to reveal yourself to us as we get to know you better. Grow in our hearts. Grow in our lives. Give us strength for the time ahead and use us to be your arms of love to relieve the suffering in our world and in our life. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a happy Sabbath, and we will see you very soon.